Hey, Pastor Joe here from Faith Church. Really glad you jumped online to check out the sermon content. Hope it encourages you as you grow. We all know pluses and minus. Not the math version, but the pros, right? The pluses of something, the positive, the good stuff, the things that we want, and the negatives, the not so good stuff, the the upside of something and the downside of something. We all know about these categories, and we know that every person, right, has pluses and minuses. Every single one. There's not a human that doesn't have both pluses and minuses in every category, pluses and minuses. And when you try to separate it out and go, you know, that person is so great. I mean, she is amazing. And you don't see any downside. You're not seeing clearly. Or I hate that person. They are beep, like fill in the mic, right? You don't see the downside, right? That, there's something about that that's not accurate. All of us have pluses and minuses. And every leader has pluses and minuses too, right? So you got this new boss and she's a rock star. You move from one department to another and you got this person and you know she's awesome, she does such a great job and you work with her for three weeks or three months, you think she walks on water and then you're with her for three years and you realize she doesn't walk on water, right? Like you know she's got pluses and she has minuses. Every leader does. Should we talk about United States presidents for a moment and look at, as leaders, pluses and minuses? We could go back as far as you want to George Washington. Let's start with Reagan. Reagan, pluses and minuses. Clinton, pluses and minuses. Bush, pluses and minuses. Obama, pluses and minuses. Trump, pluses and minuses. President Biden, pluses and minuses. To not see that every leader has Pluses and minuses is not to see clearly. Every person, and therefore every leader, and let's go to government. Every government has pluses and minuses. So a monarchy or a kingdom, right? There's pluses and minuses to a monarchy or a kingdom. We left a monarchy, England, and we made a new country with a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of government, right? So the kingdom of England had pluses and minuses, and the minuses caused us to say, we want to start over and do something different. We started a democratic republic. And did you know that a democratic republic is also full of pluses and minuses? There's good stuff about it and not so good stuff about it. It's true in all of these categories. And here's why this is important. Because as humans, we all go through hard times. And whenever we go through a difficult time, whether it's a health crisis, an economic crisis, a military crisis, we're all looking for someone to lead us out of that crisis. And what we tend to do is we look at leaders when we're in a crisis and see all their positives and not see their negatives. Or we see all their negatives and we ignore their positives. That is not seeing things clearly. Because whether in crisis or not in crisis, there are pluses and minuses to every leader and every government. And when we see that accurately, that helps us to move forward. And so I want you to keep in your mind this whole notion of pluses and minuses among people, leaders, and governments as you open up your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Turn your Bible on, open up a paper copy, 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're in this series as a church family going through the entire Bible in 2022, and right now we're in a historic section of the Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 8, where the Jewish people who are going to become the nation of Israel are in this development spot. They're growing and changing, and God has led them out of slavery into a promised land, given them an inheritance and great new property. And as God's leading them out, they have moments where they see the goodness of God clearly. They see God's faithfulness and kindness and graciousness 
And what happens is when you see God's goodness, we, we do this too, but the people of Israel throughout this section in their history, they're seeing the goodness, we see the goodness of God, and we experience the goodness of God, and then we wander away from the goodness of God because it's so good. We go, oh, I'm gonna wander away a little bit. And then God brings hardship into our lives. He brings hardship into the nation of Israel, and they cry out and ask God to help them because they're in distress. And one of the interesting things that God does when we're struggling when we cry out for help, oftentimes he brings us leadership. And through the history of the people of Israel, he brought them the leader Moses to help them. Then he brought them the leader Joshua to help them. Now we're in a section of scripture where remember he raises up judges or governors who are going to help them out of the trouble they're finding themselves in. And as long as this judge, this leader is guiding them, the people of Israel follow. And as soon as that judge leaves, they stop following. And they go through this cycle of leaders who are trying to help. They get out of, stuck out of a situation and then they get themselves back into the situation. And for Samuel is interesting because Samuel, the person, is actually the last of the judges that God raises up to lead his people. And he's kind of interesting. He's a little bit different. Samuel, the one who wrote the book you're reading, is a prophet. He's someone who speaks on God's behalf. He's also a priest. He's someone that sort of intermediary between God and people, and he happens to be a judge or a governor as well. So he has this unique component of all three things, and he's loved and respected by God's people. And he's going to help lead the country through a transition, this nation. I encourage you to read 1 Samuel 1 through 7, where we learn the history of how Samuel became this kind of governor. But we're jumping into 1 Samuel 8. And this is at the end of Samuel's life. He's almost finished leading. What do you just have to know about him? He's a humble, godly leader who the people respect. Would you pray with me? God, thanks so much for the opportunity to open your word today, a timeless, ancient document that has something to say to us today. Would you help us to put aside every distraction at home or here on campus? Quiet ourselves. And help us to lean in and learn and to be humble. Because all of us know our pluses and minuses. We all have our struggles and shortcomings, our strengths. We want to see clearly today, God, which requires humility Help us, I pray, use your spirit to do something that I can't do, to teach and to lead and guide every person listening. I pray this through Christ our Lord, amen. First Samuel chapter eight, verse one. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah and they served at Beersheba. But Samuel's sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Remember, every leader has pluses and minuses. Samuel is this respected leader. He has pluses and minuses too. He comes to the end of his life and he turns over leadership of his country to his sons. Makes sense, right? Except that his sons perverted justice, accepted bribes, pursued dishonest gain. Samuel raised his boys a certain way, and yet they deviated from the ways of their father. And these boys, their minuses, overcame their pluses. Verse 4, and so all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, you are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as other nations have. Imagine this. The elders come and go, you are old. That's kind of <laughs> awesome, right? You are old. And your sons don't follow your ways. Now give us a king. We're in this transition for the people of Israel. Understand that the people of Israel are, represent millions of people, and they're held together by their worship of God and a loose form of some kind of leadership called elders. And now they're at a point where this guy they respect is about to die, and the one who's going to take the responsibility next, the next two guys, are corrupt. And so these leaders come, and they, they go, we want a king. 
This is normal, right? You would expect this. This is good. Millions of people need a leader and not a corrupt one. So they're asking for a king. And did you see why they're asking for a king? Give us a king. Now appoint a king to lead us such as the other nations have. So they're looking around and they're seeing, while well, the leaders we have are corrupt, but the leaders around us, they all have a king, and we don't have a king. We got these corrupt Samuel kids, right? And we, we don't like them, so we want a king. And are there pluses and minuses to a king? Are they seeing that there are pluses and minuses to a king? They see the corruption of these two men. Do they see that the king could also be corrupt as well? No, they're not seeing that. They're just seeing we have a problem, and the way to fix it, we have this sight of something that we want, a king, and all the upsides and all the pluses of the king, we want that, and we're ignoring the possibility of a downside. And they say, give us a king. Verse six, but when they said, give us a king, this displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord. Why would it displease Samuel? Why would it not make Samuel happy? It could be a number of reasons, but when you're old and you've been a leader and you have to pass your leadership responsibility to the next generation, that's hard stuff, right? So one of the reasons it might not be that easy for Samuel is he's looking at his own life in the mirror and going, hey, I used to be the guy and now I'm not gonna be the guy and I'm gonna die. And that's hard. There's grief to that. Maybe he's looking at his boys and going, didn't I raise them better than this? Didn't they see me try my best? And man, how could they become this? And now the elders are drawing attention to the fact that my sons are dopes. And like, this must grieve him as well. But there's an aspect of this where Samuel knows the very heart of God. And he knows in Leviticus chapter 20, God says, you are He's talking to the nation of Israel, the people of, he's saying, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Samuel knows the heart of God, that God rescued this people and made a contract, a covenant with these people and said, you guys aren't like anybody else. You're different. I'm your protector and your provider. I want you to live and act differently. And now they're acting just like everybody else. See the next kid over there? They have more than I do. They got a king. I want that. And Samuel's looking at them and going, wow, this isn't what God's design is for your life, nation of Israel. You're supposed to be different than the other countries. This displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all the people what they're saying to you. It's not you that they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. And they've done that from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing this to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king will reign over them and claim as his rights. God's like, Samuel, listen, I know this displeases you, but you gotta know it's not you that they've rejected. They've rejected me, and this is what they've always done, the people of Israel. They've been rejecting me since I brought them out of Egypt and looking at everybody else's nation and becoming like them. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So, so Samuel, give them what they want. If that's what they want, a king, give it to them. Listen to them. Warn them. Tell them what that's going to mean, but give them what they want. Verse 10, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king will reign over you, will claim as his rights. The king will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others will make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. We want a king, Samuel warns them and says, if you guys 
want a king, then you can get it. And a king will give you leadership, yes, but a king will also take some things from you. A king will take your resources and a king will take your freedoms. And he details out the taxes, the military, the government service. And by the way, down the road, there will be no turning back. You will eventually lose your freedom and become a slave to this king, he warns them. Verse 18, and when that day comes, when you're a slave to the king, you will cry out for relief from the king. You have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Samuel says, slow down. I know the system we have right now, and I get it. My, my sons are corrupt. We gotta do something different, but this isn't the way. This king that you want isn't all pluses. There's a downside. There is a negative. Listen to what you're considering, verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said. We want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. You see, they're unwilling to see the ups and the downs, the pluses and the minuses, the pros and the cons. Just give us a king. And they're connecting. Like, we just want this king because the king is going to lead us in battle. Who has led God's people in battle up to this moment? Who has protected them, provided for them, led them, guided them, cared for them, given them everything they need? God has done that. And now they're saying God isn't good enough. They're not connecting the fact that the reason they're in the spot they are in is because of their own decisions. They're bringing pain and discomfort and war into their own lives as a people. They're making poor decisions and not following God, and because of that, there are consequences coming to them, but they're not able to see that. All they want is this king who can help them, and they're not seeing that the king is going to bring problems into their lives. They're not seeing their role, they're not seeing the downside of the king, and they're not seeking God. They're not in this moment going, man, the system we have is broken, we need a different system. God, what would you have for us? What do you want for us as your nation, as your people? Instead, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, and we're blind to the downside of what a king will bring. Verse 21, when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. You, you get this sense that Samuel's torn because he sees the plus, pluses and minuses and he knows this isn't going to go good. He's like, God, really? Should we do this? And the Lord answered him again, listen to them and give them a king. And then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. His way of saying, okay, let's get a king. We'll go shopping for one. And God knows there's downside. Samuel knows there's downside. But people are missing this. They're not seeing their role. They're not seeing the pluses and minuses of their decision. And God is now going to give them what they want. And you see this pattern in the Bible, but you also see this pattern in our lives and the lives of people in history, that God gives us what we want, even with what we want has negative consequences. God's like, warn them. Tell them not to do this. But if that's what they want, even though there are negative consequences, if that's what they want, give them what they want. Why would God do that? That's actually a part of God's goodness, that he loves us so much that he gives us what we want, even when what we want has negative consequences. And how can that be? It's because God knows he's better, greater, stronger, more supreme and satisfying than any other thing in this world. And he's like, listen, there's no competition. I'm the greatest. I'm going to satisfy you and forgive you and love you and help you, serve you. But if you want to choose something worse, I'm not going to fight you about it. Go ahead. Because what you're going to find when you choose not me, what you're going to find when you follow your own way, is it's going to lead you to not be satisfied. It's going to bring you more pain, more struggle, more heartache, more difficulty, more guilt, more shame. If that's what you want, go ahead. 
Because when you get to the point where you've had enough with your decision making and your pleasures and your role and your ideas, you'll come back to me and I'll be here and I'll welcome you and I'll forgive you and I'll help you and I'll serve you and I'll be with you always. If that's what you want, go ahead. I'll let you do whatever you want because you're going to get to the point where you see that I am what you want and he lets us choose what we do. And you know, no matter how great and awesome God is, and he is. It's amazing how when I make stupid decisions and I ask for his help, he helps me, and he promises to use all things for my ultimate good and his ultimate glory, which is wonderful in his sovereignty, but it's amazing how much stupid pain we bring into our own lives. It's amazing the suitcases of drama and baggage and heartache and anxiety and stress we accumulate for ourselves. God forgives, God helps, God cares, God loves, God redeems. Yes, 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 yes. But boy, oh boy, do I bring a lot of stupid suitcases of pain and carry it along my life because I haven't chosen to follow and trust him. So Israel's claiming we want a king, and everything will be great if we have a king. Samuel warns them, if you choose a king, there's negative consequences, but if that's what you want, and as you read the book of 1 Samuel, you'll find God's first king shows up for the people of Israel. And I want you to look at the description in 1 Samuel chapter 9 of their king. Saul is his name. As handsome as a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. I mean, isn't this the quintessential leader? Tall, dark, and handsome, right? That's what we want. We want a king, and God gives them what every person clamors for. Tall, dark, and handsome, who, as you read the rest of 1 Samuel, he becomes a strong military leader. He's exactly what they want. What you don't see, unless you dig a little bit in these early chapters in 1 Samuel 9, is that there's a foreshadowing going on that yes, people want something from the outside, tall, dark, and handsome, but inside this guy Saul is a train wreck. He comes from a tribe that doesn't honor God. He comes from a people group that's spiritually bankrupt. He's trouble. But that's what you want? You want someone who's tall, dark, and handsome, and strong, and capable, and can win wars? God's like, I'll give it to you, but this person that you wanted is spiritually bankrupt, and he is going to bankrupt your country. Read the rest of 1 Samuel. He's going to lose his kingship because he doesn't have a heart after God. But God's like, I'll give you what you want. And the people go into greater difficulty, sadness, and pain because they wanted this kind of king. So what do we learn from all of this? We learn that every person and leader in government has pluses and minuses, and we want what we want when we want it, and we'll ignore or turn a blind eye to the negative as long as we get what we want for the moment. We'll turn a blind eye, right? And so I wonder, asking the question, does God have pluses and minuses? I mean, is there a way to frame this so you go, God, do you have pluses and minuses? Well, there's some clear pros about God, right? I think it's fair to say, like, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He's everywhere present. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. Those are some pretty strong pluses, right, in the category? Pretty strong stuff. Does God have negatives, downside? Well, does God take anything from you? Well, he takes your sin. Does God want anything from you? Well, he wants you to trust him. He wants you to follow him. And when you give him your sin and you give him your obedience and you give him your loyalty, what does he give you in return? He gives you a new heart, a new life. He gives you his spirit to live inside you. He gives you peace and power and his presence with you wherever you go no matter what is going on in your life? Is there pluses and minuses when it comes to God? If you want to frame it that way. But when you look at people and leaders and governments, there's very clear pluses and minuses. And the way God designed us is that we are to live with loyalty to him first, and all of this stuff is secondary. 
Because all of these things and systems have pluses and minuses. So when you think of a person, every person has pluses and minuses. You know what that means? That means every person will disappoint you. Every single one. Your wife, your mother, your dad, your cousin, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your teacher. Every single person is going to disappoint you because they have pluses and minuses. And oh, by the way, newsflash, you will disappoint you. You will disappoint yourself. If we had a list of all the things that you'd go, let me write down on a page all my pluses and minuses. You would write how smart you are, how athletic you are, how mature you are, how old you are. You'd write down just how vibrant a personality you have and how much money you have in the bank account. You'd have all these pluses that you would list. But are those pluses enough to overcome your negatives and weaknesses? And if you decided, you know what, I have all my pluses, but I'm going to focus on getting rid of some of these negatives. If you spent your entire life, would you erase all of your negatives so that you wouldn't disappoint your wife or your friend or your spouse or your neighbor again? Is it possible to you ever work hard enough to become a person that has no downside? Every person will disappoint you and you will disappoint yourself. And every leader will disappoint you. You know what that means? That means your teacher, your principal, your school board. That means your therapist, your coach, and your pastor. That means your mayor, your governor, and your president. Any person you would put into the category of leader in your life has pluses and minuses, they will disappoint you and let you down. And oh, by the way, your government will let you down because your government is made up of leaders who have pluses and minuses and leaders and people who have pluses and minuses. So every government will let you down. And oh, by the way, if you're a student of history, you know that every government promises that we are here to serve the people. But what happens over time, study every government, every government gets to the point where the people serve the government and the government benefits from the people. Oh, that's not true, really? Look at the red tape in Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. from Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike. They all make their promises to us on the campaign trails. They all take our money, they take our taxes, and what do they give us? Do they solve our problems? But guess what? Every politician, Democrat, Republican, and Independent, leaves office rich. And I'm not making a political statement. I'm just trying to help us see clearly that governments and leaders and people have pluses and minuses and will let us down, but not God. He will not let you down. And he designed us to find our hope in him and put our trust in him. And when we put our trust in him, it takes all of these things and puts them into the right categories, right? And so what does this mean practically? Here's what it means, this is important. When my loyalty is to God first, I can be disappointed, but I will never be shaken. Doesn't change the fact that disappointment is hard. Doesn't change the fact that person in my life who I thought was all positive, but now they're abusive to me and they're mistreating me. My boss, who's supposed to be my leader, is being unjust. My government, who promised me this, is not coming through. It doesn't mean that this isn't going to be hard to be disappointed, but I won't be shaken because my God is bigger than all of this and my loyalty and trust is to him first and foremost. And when I put my trust in him, he is sovereign all over all things and he allows people and leaders and governments into my life for not that to be my sole affection and loyalty, but for that to be a part of my life, but not my life. He is my life. He is my joy, he is my hope, he is my peace, and that allows me to be disappointed but not to be shaken, to grieve but to not have my foundation knocked out. The world and its desires will pass away, Jesus' best friend said. But whoever does the will of God lives 
forever. What does that mean? It means my loyalty and allegiance stays up here. This stuff is going to shift and move and pass away. It's okay because it's not going to shake me to the core. When this stuff moves, I keep landing on God over and over and over again. And he is my rock and my fortress and my refuge and my strength and ever-present help in time of need. When my loyalty is to God first, I can engage in this disappointing world, right? So there's an aspect of Christianity and religion that will say, well, if, if people are going to disappoint you and governments are going to disappoint you and people, leaders are going to let you down, then you should probably retreat from the world because God is the only one who won't let you down. And so retreat and live in some sort of holy huddle somewhere. <laughs> And live that way and stay away from the things that are going to disappoint you and put your trust only in God. No, no, no. That is not biblical Christianity. It's because my hope is in God that I can engage these things. And though I'm going to be disappointed, while leaders and people and school boards and governments and pastors and churches and counselors are going to let me down, I engage all of these things because God is in me. And I want to bring good into this world. And I want to be a part of a solution, not be a part of the problem. And so I want to bring light and love into every aspect of society, knowing that it's going to disappoint me and it's going to let me down, but that's okay because your kingdom come, your will be done in every barbershop and martial arts studio, in every mechanic and landscaper, every innovation and healthcare, every part of medicine and beauty Every aspect of this world, financial, arts, sciences, emotional, every aspect comes under the lordship of God. And I can be a stay-at-home dad and mom and make a difference. And I can struggle with infertility and make a difference. And I can have hardship and disappointment and struggle and go through divorce and grief and all of it under God who is my refuge and strength in an ever-present time of need of help. I can do all things to serve this world and make a difference, right? And so here's what's so important. All of that's true. But listen to what Paul says. This is so important. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. What does that mean? It means, yes, we're in this world and God is above this world and our loyalty and allegiance is to him and to him first, which means as we engage with these aspects of the world, we don't do it like everyone else does it. We do it different because we are different in Christ. So if you find yourself fighting for a political leader or a government and acting like just like everybody else in our world, then that says to me your loyalty is out of whack. You don't need to fight like that. You can fight like Jesus. He was loving and patient and kind and slow to anger and abounding in grace and truth. You can fight like him, which is peaceful and respectful, and bring about goodness and change in this world, but you don't do it like everybody else. Guys, this is such a stupid little simple diagram, but I'll tell you what, this is so important to me and something I so want to impart to you as a family, because this world is so whack right now. Did you know I'm a person? Raise your hand, right? I'm a person. Uh, Did you know I'm a leader? You may not know this, but I love politics. I really do. I love politics. And I'm engaged in all of these things. But you know what? When I see everything in these categories as pluses and I don't see any minuses, I get out of whack as a person and a leader and a citizen. When I see everything that's going on in our world and it's death and grim and everything is negative, I get out of whack in all of these categories. You know, family, we're out of whack. But you want peace in your heart? Ask God to help you see the pluses and minuses of everything. And if you only see pluses, you're not seeing clearly. Beg him for the humility to see clearly. And if you're only seeing negatives, you are not seeing clearly. Ask God for the humility to see clearly. And if you're fighting like everyone else is fighting, then you are not living like Jesus, ask him to humble you and allow you to be a part of the 
solution, not to be a part of the problem. If we could do this under God, there would be more peace in our hearts, more peace in our homes, more peace in our schools, more peace in our community, more peace in our nation to see everything under God. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, because without you, we would not have hope and we would not be forgiven and our negatives would lead us to hell and would separate us from you forever. But with Jesus, who loves us with our pluses and minuses, welcomes us to himself and changes us and gives us peace and joy. So thank you. Thank you for your word that we can read this ancient document that gives us insight into today. Thank you so much for the nation of Israel and for the journey that we get to watch in their lives so that we can learn about our life. God, help us to see clearly that every person, leader, government has pros and cons to the extent that we can't forgive us and mature us, correct us and grow us, that we might be a part of the solution in the Lehigh Valley and the world and not a part of the problem that we might be guided by love and peace and patience, kindness and gentleness and self-control, like Jesus, that we would engage all the disappointment and grief and the struggle, struggle politically, economically. That we would engage all of it like him to the end that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In every barber shop and every mechanics shop and every science laboratory and doctor's office and every art studio and music studio, filmmakers, financial planners, stay-at-home moms and dads and educators, every corner and every aspect, may the light and love of Christ pierce the darkness and bring goodness. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. 